Bonjour tout le monde. Hi everybody. Welcome you back to those who were, were with us for the, uh, the last two weeks in the symposium. Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue. Euh, J'attends juste quelques petites euh, secondes pour permettre aux gens d'y arriver. Hi everybody, welcome. I'll just take a few seconds just to let everybody in. I see we're having lots of people uh, joining us. Je vois le nombre de participants grimper. Et je vais attendre encore 10 secondes. J'espère que vous voyez bien le, le PowerPoint. Um, I'll just start in, uh, start in a few seconds. Okay. Okay, all right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the first four per thousand North America regional meeting. Today's session is um, the introduction and general presentation of the regional context vis-à-vis Uh, for per thousand initiative. Bienvenue tout le monde à la première réunion régionale 4 pour 1000 Amérique du Nord. La session d'aujourd'hui s'intitule Introduction et présentation générale du contexte régional vis-à-vis -vis, uh, 4 pour 1000, l'initiative 4 pour 1000. So, before we start it, um, I would like to go over some technical, uh, technical stuff just to make sure that everything goes smoothly for this session. Um, today is going to be bilingual, so some of the presentation will be in French and some will be in English. And we're super happy to be offering live simultaneous translation French to English and vice versa. Um, so let's uh, try it. If you would like to um, to hear to listen to the presentation in English and you don't understand. French, I would invite you all to go to the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen and choose the English uh, channel. And you actually can try it right now because I'm gonna switch in, in, in French in a few seconds. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, la session d'aujourd'hui sera bilingue. Les présentations seront en, en anglais et deux présentations seront en français. Donc, si vous voulez écouter la, la, les, les présentations uh, en français, vous devez choisir uh, la langue française dans les comptes d'interprétation qui se trouvent en bas de votre écran Zoom. Um, et nos, uh, nos magnifiques, notre magnifique équipe de traducteurs se feront un plaisir de vous guider uh, à travers la session en français. Si jamais vous avez des questions techniques, s'il vous plaît, nous écrire dans les comptes chat ou converser, encore une fois, en bas de, de, de votre écran. Um, je vous invite uh, maintenant à... à, à à, utiliser le, le, à choisir français, je vais, je vais changer en anglais pour uh, s'assurer que tout est bien pour vous. Now I'll switch back to English. Everybody should now be able to understand what is said. Can I please get a few raised hand uh, just to make sure that you're understanding and, and, and you're using the interpretation icon. To raise your hand, you can go to participant icon and just select to raise your hand. Fantastic. I'll see at least 20 raised hand right now. So thank you very much. Now you can lower your hand. Okay, now that everybody can uh, understand what is said, I would like to officially welcome you um, on behalf of my team to the first four per thousand North America Regional Virtual Meeting. My name is Antonius Petro, and I am the Scientific Director at Regeneration Canada. Regeneration Canada is a non-for-profit organization uh, uh, based on Montreal that promotes land management practices uh, that regenerate soil health in order to mitigate climate change, restore biodiversity, improve water cycle, and support a more productive and uh, just food system in Canada. It's a great pleasure to meet you all, and it's such an honor to be co-hosting this meeting with the 4 per thousand team. This meeting is all about soil and land, and I believe we cannot talk about land without acknowledging in which territory uh, we stand, we work, and we learn. 
the head office of our organization, Regeneration Canada, and where the core team uh, lives and work is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Yeninga are recognized as the custodians of these lands and water. Chojage or Montreal is known as a historic gathering place for many indigenous community. Our friends um, and members of Regeneration Canada are spread from coast to coast, living on and working lands that have been cared for by First Nation, Métis, and Inuit. Um, today, we're virtually together from different parts of the world to celebrate the generosity and richness of Mother Earth that sustains us all. We hope this will be an opportunity for beautiful exchanges through the sharing of knowledge and experience. For me, the importance of this meeting, uh, for this meeting uh, goes beyond the gathering change makers from scientists to farmers to government officials from Canada and the United States around the same table to share their experience and barriers uh, in respect to soil health practices and soil carbon sequestration. It actually demonstrates the need for having an umbrella organization like four per thousand to channel this conversation all over the globe with one goal, reverse climate change and feed the world. And what it makes really unique um, is the simplicity of the message. We simply need to add an annual growth rate of four per thousand, uh, for per thousand um, of soil uh, carbon stocks to significantly reduce the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere related to human activities. As some of you might know, this meeting was supposed to take place on March 17th to 18th in Montreal as part of our Living Soil Symposium. A week before, we took the hard decision to cancel both in-person events due to the coronavirus pandemic. Since we've, been, we've put great effort into adapting to the situation and recognizing the whole thing to be able, uh, sorry, reorganizing the whole thing to be able to offer a virtual version. It has been such a great experience to collaborate with the four per thousand team, especially Dr. Paul um, and Beatrice. And we're all very excited to spend these five days with you all and it's really surprising how real connection can be made despite an online experience. We've lived this for the past um, two weeks during our Living Soil Symposium. So thank you very much. And now I will, uh, I'll give the floor to my colleague, Gabrielle, who has a few words um, for you. Gabrielle, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Antonius. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome. It is truly an honor to be gathered with you all virtually for this first North American regional meeting of the 4 per 1000 initiative. So I'm Gabrielle Bastien, the founder at Regeneration Canada. Um, and I want to start by saying we feel even more privileged to be gathered with you all in this particular moment in time, given the exceptional circumstances we're all going through. So I want to start by acknowledging that we are in these particular circumstances and by extending our deep gratitude to you for taking the time to join us right now. The 4 per 1000 initiative has been a very important ally and partner of our organization since our very beginnings. And I'd even say it played a crucial role in the history of our organization. Um, I first met Paul Lou as, when, as well as Stéphane Le Feuille at the first 4 per 1000 General Assembly in 2016 at COP22 in Marrakesh. And that trip was actually the turning point that led me to found Regeneration Canada. 4 per 1000 has supported us ever since and has been key in linking us with different partners around the world. So when Paul reached out to propose that we co-host the first North American regional meeting uh, in conjunction with our Living Soil Symposium, it was both natural for us to play that role, but also really an honor to be able to serve as a convener for this most important meeting. To drive systemic change, such as is required for transforming the way we manage our land, we believe it's crucial to adopt a multi-stakeholder approach and to act at all levels, internationally, regionally, and locally. This meeting reflects the importance of all of these approaches. We are humbled by the amount of expertise of everyone gathered for this meeting, and we very much look forward to learning from you all and to discussing how to better work together towards our goals. So thank you so much, Paul, Beatrice, and Antonius for all of your dedicated work in making this event possible. 
And thank you all for being here and coming to share your perspectives and learn. So now it is my pleasure to introduce the chair and moderator of our session, Dr. Paul Liu. Uh, Paul is an agronomist specialized in tropical agronomy, graduate from AgroParisTech, the Institute of Tropical Areas of Montpellier, the National High School of Agricultural Applied Sciences of Dijon, and the University of Montpellier. Paul is the Executive Secretary of the 4 per Thousand Initiative since 2016. So without further ado, Paul, uh, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Good morning to all. Thank you very much, Gabriel, for those uh, very nice words and a very good introduction. Thank you, Antonio. Antonio, for, for also your word. Well, uh, I'm glad to welcome you to the, the first North America Regional Meeting of the 4 per Mill Initiative, which is held, of course, online. And it will be held every day until Friday, May 15. As you know, this regional meeting, as Antonio said, was scheduled to take place in Montreal on March 17 and 18. But the COVID-19 pandemic has been changing our life since mid-March and uh, even the beginning of the year for some part of the world. And we have had to adapt. I wish to begin this meeting with a thought for all the families who have been affected by the disease and hope that you who are participating to this session and your loved one are in good health and safe. Our regional meeting will therefore take place online via Zoom thanks to the perfect logistical organization of our friend from Regeneration Canada. And again, thank you very much to Gabrielle and Antonius and all the team and Sarah and others that are not here today visible, but they are there. And uh, this was possible also as well uh, as the contribution of the French Embassy in Washington, whose expertise covers United States and Canada. May our partners I have just mentioned be amply and warmly thanks for their involvement and support. The objective of this regional meeting is to give the floor to all the actors who can act on soil carbon sequestration and soil health, decision maker, farmers, scientists, NGOs, and businesses. Everyone will be able to present their point of view and interact with each other. At the end of this week of meetings, we hope to be able to propose a synthesis in the form of a kind of regional roadmap for concrete action on the ground in favor of soil carbon storage and soil health through agriculture and forestry. Initially, our work was to be held over a day and a half in person, and we were therefore forced to adapt the format in, format in five sessions of 90 to 120 minutes, always at the same time, every day, in order to leave sufficient time for exchanges. Are there are many of us online we will be in webinar configuration, as Antonius explained to you, with a section at your disposal for question and answer. We have the comfort also to have a simultaneous translation in French and English. And at the end of each session, starting tomorrow, we will make available and online a specific survey on the form of multiple choice question to gather your opinion on a few targeted questions. Thank you for completing the survey within the allotted time, starting from tomorrow. So, now I think I will uh, take the floor and make a presentation to you about the progress we had in the 4 per meal initiative. And uh, I will share my screen for that. Sorry for the time being, okay. Here we are, I hope you can see my screen. And um, I will, because we are supposed to have this meeting in Quebec, uh, I will respect a kind of duality in presentation and I will shift to French if you forgive me and if you allow me to do so. Bien, mesdames et messieurs, je suis ravi de vous retrouver donc pour cette uh, présentation. Nous allons uh, pendant 10 minutes, essayer de voir un petit peu quels ont été les progrès depuis euh, le début de l'initiative 4 pour 1000. 
Tout d'abord, pourquoi est-il si important de stocker du carbone dans les sols Cela maintenant est devenu presque une évidence pour beaucoup d'entre nous. Stocker du carbone dans les sols nous permet de lutter contre les changements climatiques, nous permet aussi à l'agriculture de s'adapter, notamment à travers la rétention de l'eau ou à travers la, une moindre sensibilité à l'érosion des sols, mais aussi à améliorer la sécurité alimentaire et lutter contre la dégradation des sols. Alors ce nom de 4 pour 1000, certains d'entre vous sont familiers avec lui, certains savent d'où il vient, d'autres peut-être pas. Attardons-nous trois minutes sur ce, ce nom un petit peu curieux. En fait, il provient d'un calcul qui a été fait, ce que nos amis anglo-saxons appellent « back of the envelope calculation » ou un calcul de nappe de, de restaurant, comme on dit en France. Et elle prend appui sur le fait qu'on évalue chaque année à à peu près 10, millions de, 10 000 pardon, gigatonnes je vais y arriver, excusez-moi, 10 gigatonnes, c'est déjà suffisant, de carbone relâché dans l'atmosphère dû aux activités humaines, qu'il s'agisse du transport, de l'énergie, de, de l'industrie ou de la déforestation. Et sur ces 10 gigatonnes de carbone, seulement un petit peu plus de la moitié sont recapturées par la végétation naturelle d'une part et d'autre part par les océans. Ce qui laisse un flux net annuel d'environ 4,3 gigatonnes de carbone. Or, si on regarde cette quantité et si on la compare à la quantité de carbone qui est présente dans les sols, et notamment les 30 à 40 premiers centimètres, on s'aperçoit que euh, si on arrivait à augmenter de 0,4% la quantité de carbone présente dans tous les sols de la planète chaque année, eh bien, on arriverait à peu près à équilibrer, à compenser ces 4,3 gigatonnes de carbone qui, au final, sont relâchés de l'atmosphère par les activités humaines. Et c'est de là qu'est venu ce calcul, donc 0,4% égale en français 4 pour 1000. Alors, les objectifs de l'initiative 4 pour 1000, ils sont multiples. Le premier objectif est, est donc de stocker du carbone dans les sols, à partir de la matière organique notamment, et ceci permettra d'atteindre un triple, des triples cibles, Premièrement, d'améliorer la sécurité alimentaire mondiale. Deuxièmement, d'adapter l'agriculture au changement climatique qui est déjà en cours. Et troisièmement, de lutter, de contribuer à lutter contre le changement climatique. Le tout dans le cadre, bien sûr, des ODD, des Objectifs de Développement Durable de, des Nations Unies. Alors, ces, o, ces ODD, ils sont trois principalement à être concernés par l'initiative, le 2, le 15 et le 13. Il y en a deux autres qui sont touchés à la marge, qui sont le 6 sur l'eau et le 12 sur la, la production responsable, et puis le 17 pour les partenariats internationaux. Bien évidemment, nous avons tenu à ce qu'il y ait aussi des, certaines sauvegardes qui nous permettent de, de contrôler que nous ne faisons pas n'importe quoi, et notamment concernant la tenue des sols, la, les droits de l'homme et welfare, well-being also, aussi, pour ne pas oublier ces objectifs qui sont très importants. L'initiative 4 pour 1000, depuis son début euh, en 2015, à la COP21, est articulée autour de deux parties, un programme scientifique d'un côté et un plan d'action sur le terrain. On va venir un petit peu plus dans les détails sur ce qui a été fait depuis sa création. Nous avons mis en place, comme l'a rappelé Gabriel à, à Marrakech, à la COP22, la gouvernance de l'initiative avec la création du Forum des partenaires qui a tenu sa première réunion le consortium des membres et le bureau qui est son émanation, qui est l'instance de décision, et le comité scientifique et technique qui constitue la référence scientifique de l'initiative, le secrétariat exécutif que j'ai l'honneur et le plaisir de diriger étant l'organe exécutif de l'initiative. Aujourd'hui, nous, nous comptons près de 465 signataires de la Déclaration de Paris, c'est-à-dire nous avons 465 partenaires qui sont soit des pays, soit des organisations internationales, soit des fondations, des, des banques de développement, des ONG, des instances de recherche et d'enseignement, des universités, des groupements de producteurs agricoles, mais aussi des entreprises. Vous avez le nombre détaillé dans cette diapositive. Et parmi ces 465 partenaires, figure 220 membres qui ont signé la deuxième déclaration qui contrôle notre gouvernance 
et qui ont contribué à élire le docteur Ibrahim Mayaki, qui est le secrétaire exécutif du NEPAD en Afrique, notre président, et M. Stéphane Le Foll, ancien ministre de l'Agriculture de France, comme notre vice-président. Voilà une carte un petit peu résumée, schématique, des quelques pays membres et partenaires, plus d'autres organisations à travers leur logo. Vous allez retrouver, si vous allez sur notre site, cette carte qui vous donnera un petit peu plus d'informations sur nos partenaires et nos membres à travers le monde. Le le comité scientifique et technique, j'en ai parlé, il est composé, lorsqu'il est complet, de 14 scientifiques de haut niveau internationaux. Vous en avez 12 ici, puisqu'il y en a deux qui sont en cours de nomination actuellement. Et ces personnalités sont réparties à parts égales entre les hommes et les femmes, et également en ce qui concerne la répartition géographique de leur origine. Comme vous pouvez le voir sur cette carte, on en a autant en Amérique, qu'en Asie, qu'en Océanie, ou en Afrique ou en Europe. Alors, qu'avons-nous fait depuis 2015 au niveau de l'initiative En ce qui concerne le volet scientifique, eh bien, le comité scientifique et technique s'est installé, comme je vous l'ai dit, il a déjà eu huit réunions, il a travaillé sur des articles, il a travaillé sur un référentiel d'indicateurs et de critères pour l'évaluation de projets, qu'il a d'ailleurs appliqué à un certain nombre de projets, plus d'une vingtaine depuis le début de son existence. Il a un projet de livre en cours, mais il a aussi participé lui-même, et puis nous, à travers le secrétariat, participé à beaucoup de réunions internationales, aussi bien au niveau de CIRCASA, au niveau de, du Global Soul Partnership, au niveau des grandes orientations de recherche, au niveau du processus de Cornivia, qui était extrêmement important pour qu'on parle de l'agriculture dans le cadre des discussions sur le climat. Et puis, nous avons un projet aussi, dans le domaine scientifique, la création d'un tableau de bord qui permettra de suivre l'évolution de ce stockage du carbone dans les sols à travers l'agriculture. Cette diapositive vous montre un petit peu schématiquement quel est le référentiel d'indicateurs et de critères pour l'évaluation de projet. On y retrouve donc la sécurité alimentaire, l'atténuation, l'adaptation, mais aussi le, la séquestration du carbone dans les sols et la restauration des sols, et puis les fameuses procédures de sauvegarde dont j'ai parlé tout à l'heure. Sur cette diapositive, je vous ai mentionné les quatre piliers qui sont, selon le comité scientifique et technique, les plus importants pour travailler au niveau international, au niveau de la recherche et de la coopération scientifique, un projet comme CIRCASA, qui doit voir son terme arriver dans quelques mois, devrait permettre de pouvoir mettre en place l'ensemble de cette coopération. Je voulais vous dire qu'au niveau de la, des activités sur le terrain, nous avons beaucoup travaillé sur la mobilisation des différents acteurs, à travers notamment la mise en place de notre plateforme collaborative qui est allée à sa version 2, notre site internet, notre présence sur les réseaux sociaux, cela a été dit. Et nous travaillons depuis quelques semaines sur la stratégie d'initiative, qui est extrêmement importante pour nous, qui mettra en place notre vision, telle que vous la voyez, qui pour l'instant est une vision, disons, au brouillon, un draft, puisque elle n'est pas encore complètement validée par les instances décisionnelles, et qui mettra en place aussi notre mission pour 2030, et résumera à travers différents buts, euh, que ce soit depuis la création, la conceptualisation, la mise en œuvre, la promotion, la collaboration, le suivi et des activités transversales, un certain nombre d'objectifs qui déclineront donc ces différents buts et qui seront aussi mis en place à travers un programme de terrain. Cette stratégie sera validée donc d'ici à la fin du mois avec le consortium des membres. Alors bien évidemment, nous savons déjà, et les scientifiques et les agriculteurs le savent déjà, qu'il y a un certain nombre de pratiques qui permettent de stocker du carbone dans les sols. Nous, nous en avons ici résumé quelques-unes. Lorsque nous interrogeons les agriculteurs, nous savons que, que ce soit pour leur culture, pour l'élevage ou pour l'agroforesterie, ils ont un certain nombre de pratiques qu'ils considèrent comme étant importantes pour stocker ce carbone dans les sols. Et c'est pour ça que nous avons proposé que l'agriculture suive une évolution à travers le lien avec l'agroécologie. Si on reprend un schéma un petit peu bref, je veux dire très résumé, la société demande à ce qu'on utilise moins d'engrais minéraux et de produits phytosanitaires, elle demande aussi que l'on ait plus de biodiversité et plus de euh, 
carbone organique dans les sols. Et aujourd'hui, avec l'agriculture conventionnelle, nous sommes ici et nous devrions trouver l'inspiration à travers les écosystèmes forestiers naturels en suivant une évolution agroécologique de nos systèmes agricoles. Eh bien, euh, par la mise en place de différentes solutions, l'agriculture de conservation, l'agriculture biologique, le, le management euh, holistique des, des pâturages, l'agriculture régénérative, l'agriculture la, biodynamique, l'agroforesterie, nous avons des solutions qui nous permettra d'évoluer dans la bonne direction. Et bien évidemment, il est important de ne pas oublier que ceux qui font le travail sont les agriculteurs. C'est eux qui reçoivent des influences de la part de l'ensemble des autres acteurs, sur lesquels, bien évidemment, ils cherchent aussi à intervenir et à travailler en accord, de façon à ce que chacun puisse, grâce au travail des agriculteurs, trouver des solutions aux questions et aux attentes que nous avons en termes d'alimentation, en termes de production agricole, forestière, etc. Voilà, je tenais à travers ces deux derniers schémas à vous donner un petit peu les orientations vers lesquelles nous, nous souhaitons aller, et vous replacez aussi nos priorités qui sont de travailler avec les agriculteurs en les plaçant au centre du jeu, comme les sols, comme la santé des sols, et aussi l'ensemble des acteurs qui sont tous aussi importants car ils ont chacun leur, leur mot à dire et chacun leur vision dont il est important de prendre en compte pour pouvoir mener à bien notre évolution. Voilà, je vous remercie. Si vous voulez en savoir plus, bien évidemment, vous avez notre site internet, vous avez notre plateforme collaborative pour ceux qui y ont accès. Et euh, je vous retrouve un petit peu plus tard pour les questions et réponses, si vous en avez, euh, à la suite de, des présentations qui auront été faites. Voilà. Voilà donc euh, résumé un petit peu euh, ce que nous avons fait depuis quelques années. Je voudrais euh, pouvoir euh, donc lancer un petit peu, en quelque sorte, nos, nos débats et faire en sorte que les, les intervenants qui nous ont fait le plaisir de participer à notre réunion aujourd'hui puissent vous expliquer ce qui se passe en Amérique du Nord, puisque nous sommes là pour la réunion Amérique du Nord. Et euh, je vais donc repasser à l'anglais si, si vous le permettez. So, after this presentation for our session today on policies at the national and regional level in North America, we will have four presentations of 15 minutes each. Although you have their summarized biography on the agenda, I would be grateful if each speaker could briefly introduce themselves at the beginning of the presentation. The presentation will be in English or in French, as Antonio already said to you. Uh, you have the possibility, you have already, you are familiar with that to choose the, the right channel to follow in English or in French for your desired language. Of course, all the mat material of those presentations will be available after the regional meeting on our website and on the address that we will communicate to you later. It's important also to say that last but not least, each session is recorded in order to also to be also available for those who cannot attend today and for the following days. So I just recall you that if you wish to ask a question to a speaker, please do so in the Q&A section and start your question by specifying uh, to whom you wish to address your question. So further, without further ado, I will give the floor to Mrs. Lucy Clearwater from the Strategic Policy Branch of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada to speak about um, the Canada, pol Canada policy on soil health and soil carbon sequestration related to agriculture and forestry. So Mrs. Clearwater, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, so as noted, my name is Lucy Clearwater. I work with the Strategic Policy Branch of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Um, my background is in agri-environment specifically, um, but today I will be presenting a few slides on behalf of my colleagues at Natural Resources Canada's uh, Canadian Forestry Service. Um, and I'm going to start my slide now, see if it'll work. Okay, just checking, can everybody see my main slide and not my notes? 
Great. Okay. All right. So I'll just get started. All right. Sorry, bear with me here. Okay. So for this presentation, then, I'm going to give a brief overview of uh, Canada's forestry and agricultural sectors, and then I'm going to discuss some agricultural trends and policies more specifically. So just as an overview of the two sectors, uh, Canada has a very large forest sector, um, 347 million hectares of forest, representing 35% of Canada's uh, land mass and 9% of all world forest cover. Uh, its agrical extent is quite a bit smaller, but still quite large at 64 million hectares of farmland, representing just under 7% of Canada's land area and uh, about 1.3% of the world agricultural extent. So the forest sector is uh, the world's fourth largest forest product exporter, um, and the ag sector is the world's fifth largest exporter. Um, almost 90% of the forest is owned by provinces and territories. And similarly, the provinces and territories have quite a role to play uh, in the design and delivery of agricultural programs on farm. The forestry sector sequesters 14 million, uh, sorry, 14 megatons of uh, carbon dioxide a year in managed forest and associated harvested wood products. That was uh, in 2018. And the agricultural sector sequesters 6.2 megatons of carbon dioxide a year from agricultural soils. Uh, and it is a contributor as well, as you know, uh, contributing 73 megatons a year in emissions. So Canada's ma managed forest is very strongly affected by natural disturbances. So you can see on, uh, uh, excuse me, sorry. I'm just checking to see which slide are you able to see right now? Is it the overview of the sectors or the, the managed forest slide? So you have a bit of a disconnect a, with the slides. We're seeing an overview. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was a slide ahead of myself. So I'm going to skip ahead here. Uh, okay, so Canada's managed forest is very strongly affected by natural disturbance. Uh, for the past century, they've been a significant carbon uh, sink. Uh, steadily adding carbon to that which was already stored. But in recent, recent decades, the situation has reversed in some years and Canada's forests have become carbon sources, releasing more carbon into the atmosphere than they're accumulating. And, and this is uh, due to a number of factors. Uh, the annual area burned by wildfires has increased substantially and unprecedented insect outbreaks have occurred as well from such pests as mountain pine beetle and eastern spruce budworm. So uh, as you can see, there's, there's been quite a transition in that sector. Um, in contrast, when you look at uh, Canada's agricultural emissions, they've actually been relatively stable. In fact, they've been hovering around 70 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent since about 2005. And at the same time, we've seen quite a significant growth in agricultural production, which indicates some efficiency gains. Um, so you can see that agricultural soils have really turned from a net source of carbon uh, to a net sink over the last two decades, but the rate at which carbon is being sequestered annually has steadily decreased since 2006 from about 12 megatons a year to just slightly more than six tons of mega, uh, megatons a year in uh, 2018. And as a result of this, Canada's net agricultural emissions have actually increased by about 9% since 2005. So what were the main trends affecting soil carbon sequestration on Canada's farmland? Well, in 1991, when Statistics Canada started collecting data on tillage practices, conventional tillage was overwhelmingly practiced across Canada. And then over time, as more and more farmers realized the gains uh, uh, and the benefits of zero tillage and reduced tillage, especially in the prairies, um, by 2016, more than 80% of all the cropland in the country was under zero till or reduced tillage practices. And at the same time period, farmers were reducing the extent of summer fallow, which is a practice of leaving land bare for a season, ostensibly to recover, but in reality, this practice left soils bare to a rose of forces and was quite damaging. And the area under summer fallow reduced from 7.9 million hectares in 1991 to just under 900,000 hectares in 2016. And so this also contributed to some improvements in soil cover. So the next slide shows you um, 
the cumulative soil organic carbon change in agriculture. This delta map on the left is showing you organic carbon change, and this map on the right is showing you the change in soil erosion over the same period since 1981 to 2011. And those, unfortunately, are the most recent data that we have. Next year is our next reporting period for the agroenvironmental indicators, so we expect to have data up to 2016 by then. Um, so as the pre discussed in the previous slide, this is in large part from changes in tillage as well as the cessation of summer fallow, and it's most evident in the prairie region where conservation tillage is commonly practiced. So these maps illustrate the soil success story is primarily a prairie one, but because the prairies account for about 85% of our agricultural land in Canada, this has clearly influenced the national statistics. Uh, there have been some negative changes over this time period as well, due to a transition from pastures and hay fields to annual cropping systems, reflecting a decline in cattle numbers, particularly since about 2006. Um, and this trend appears more evident on the map in the areas outside the prairies, but that's just because they're not offset by those gains from zero tillage. And below these maps, you can see the risk of soil organic carbon change and the risk of soil erosion indices. These are very coarse policy tools derived from the maps and they're designed to uh, provide some high level state and trend information. Okay, so currently assuming business as usual, Canada's total agricultural emissions are projected to increase to about 76 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent by 2030. That's for a net gain of four megatons compared to 2005. And there are some fluctuations between the livestock, crop, and fuel use uh, areas, but the most striking change is, of course, right here in soil carbon. Uh, the decline in the rate of carbon removal in agricultural soils is uh, projected to continue. So by 2030, it's estimated that these agricultural soils, based on the status quo continuing, would store approximately just 1.5 megatons of carbon dioxide a year. So this uh, sharp slowdown in the sequestra uh, sequestration rate is a function of a few things. Uh, even now, no-till has been in use for over 20 years. Uh, the gains from a reduced use of summer fallow have, have maxed out, really, and the prairie soils are reaching a bit of a, an equilibrium in terms of the soil organic carbon. Um, so we could say that we've picked our low-hanging fruit in maximizing zero-till, and now we need to look to other practices and policies to get us to where we need to go. So here are some other practices uh, that offer some sequestration potential, and many of these can also offer some important co-benefits in terms of biodiversity, uh, water, quali uh, water quality protection, and uh, flood protection, climate adaptation. Uh, and of course, there are many other climate mitigation strategies undertaken as well related to precision agriculture, livestock feed amendment, manure storage, biodigesters, nutrient management planning, all those uh, beyond those activities that have a focus on carbon sequestration specifically. So what policies and programs are underway that can guide uh, the implementation of soil carbon sequestration activities on farmland? Well, uh, soil carbon sequestration is clearly recognized as a means of reducing net emissions in domestic policy initiatives. The Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change is an overarching framework impacting multiple sectors, including agriculture, and covering multiple mitigation actions. Among other things, the framework commits federal, provincial, and territorial governments to work together to protect and enhance carbon sinks, including in forest and agricultural land. Uh, specific to the agricultural sector, the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, or CAP, is a five-year framework between the federal, provincial, and territorial governments, initiated in 2018, and it includes a suite of programs to help producers address soil and water conservation, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and adapt to climate change. So, under the CAP, financial support is given via provincially-led programming on a cost-shared basis. Uh, federal government contributes about 60% and the provinces and territories contribute 40%. Uh, and this is for various agro-environmental payment schemes that are also offered on a cost-shared basis to farmers. And each province chooses which BMPs they would like to offer. And they also determine the rate of cost shares to the producers. And so depending on the practice and the province and territory, farmers typically contribute between as little as 10% to as much as 75% uh, towards the implementation of those practices. And there are other CAP programs as well, including uh, science and innovation activities, as well as development and adoption 
activities. So the full research development and technology transfer continuum is supported. So for example, the department's Living Laboratories Initiative is uh, an innovative approach that just uh, started out last year uh, to working with farmers and stakeholders on working farms to co-develop and adapt regionally appropriate practices and to accelerate the adoption of BMPs by better understanding farmers' motivations and barriers to adoption. And there are a host of business risk management programs under CAP as well to support farmers in the event of natural disasters or market disruptions. So even with a variety of practices on offer through uh, FBT cost shared funding, many farmers are understandably risk averse. And this can be seen from this slide. There's a the host of factors that must be considered before adopting a practice, particularly a novel practice. Uh, so understanding decision making is critical to the design of policies and programming. Uh, farmers tend to adopt those practices that will offer some kind of economic co-benefits, or at least that would not negatively affect uh, production or profit. Uh, also those that they are familiar with or endorsed by those that they trust, such as their peers or known extension agencies. Some soil conservation practices bring clear benefits to farmers in terms of long-term viability of the soil, such as zero till in the prairies or soil erosion BMPs in Atlantic Canada, where many farms are situated in hillier terrain. Others such as retirement of marginal land to perennial cover or the planting of shelter belts may need additional incentives or simply better advisory support to help them with their decision making. So carbon sequestration as a, reduce of, uh, as a means of reducing net emissions gained a higher prominence in uh, government priorities quite recently. The Canadian government has committed to a target to exceed Canada's 2030 emissions um, reduction goal and to achieve net zero emissions by 2050, like many other countries. Uh, so in addition to other mitigation um, practices, this will include the use of nature-based solutions, including the planting of 2 billion trees. So this action would take place over the next 10 years. And while final details are still being determined, there are discussions involving the conservation and restoration of forests, grasslands, agricultural lands, wetlands, and coastal areas. And it's very clear that both the forestry and agricultural sectors will have quite a role to play in realizing these commitments. And of course, the provinces and territories will also have a pivotal role in delivering on this file. So quickly, uh, what's next? Well, Natural Resources Canada's Canadian Forestry Service is going to lead the development of the plan to realize this commitment to plant 2 billion trees, as that falls within their mandate. Uh, and this takes quite a bit of thought and planning. There's a lot of factors to consider, as you can see from this slide. Uh, identifying locations with the greatest potential for sequestration, determining the type of trees to plant, giving consideration to urban forests, determining how this impacts the larger forestry sector and the forestry economy. And for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, there's a number of areas that we're exploring as well, including understanding uh, and overcoming the barriers associated with on-farm adopt adoption of climate mitigation BMPs, including uh, carbon sequestration BMPs. So this means looking at new strategies and programming approaches, examining different incentives, looking at de-risking innovation on farms, et cetera. So we're working with the uh, Smart Policy Institute and Equiterre right now to explore some of these approaches, including the option to run some pilot programs in coordination with interested provinces and territories. And we're also gonna need to understand the multiple co-benefits associated with nature-based solutions, such as, uh, uh, their ability to provide habitat for pollinators and natural pest predators, uh, climate adaptation benefits such as flood protection, enhancing public trust through water quality protection. Uh, and we're also looking at novel concepts such as the circular economy to reduce waste and valorize agricultural byproducts and examining how this approach can be integrated into a Canadian context. And lastly, whatever direction we take, we need to make sure that our provincial and territorial partners are on board. We need to engage with new stakeholders such as Indigenous people and complement the efforts of our federal partners such as Natural Resources Canada and Environment and Climate Change Canada as we move forward. Uh, and lastly, I should say in the immediate term, the priority for us, as with many other countries, has been to help farmers, processors and the entire supply chain to continue to operate during the COVID pandemic and in maintaining domestic food security and helping our farmers and processors overcome supply chain disruptions. So this work has understandably taken precedence over many other plans. However, encouragingly, this government and our minister has indicated that climate mitigation is still a very high priority. And so 
uh, our team at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and our counterparts and our CAN are continuing to work on these important files. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lucy. It was very, very clear and I, I learned a lot of things. And it's, well, it's not uh, a, by chance that Canada is a member of the four per meal. Of course, we are doing a lot. <laughs> so, um, thank you for your presentation. And I just would like to remind to all the participants that uh, we will group the question to all the speakers at the end of our session. You can already assign likes to the question that you seems the more relevant to you in the Q&A question. I can see many of them, maybe one or two at the moment, no more. So do not hesitate to ask a question and uh, we will deal with them at the end uh, of the session by order of preference that you, have this, you will have decided. For our speaker, just please have a look to the Q&A question also to check if some of the question concern you and that you may maybe be prepared to answer to those questions. Et maintenant, si vous me le permettez, je voudrais donner la parole à Madame Hélène Bourassa, directeur agro-environnemental, des pratiques agro-environnementales, pardon, à la Direction générale de l'appui à l'agriculture durable du ministère de l'Agriculture, des Pêcheries et de l'Alimentation du Québec pour nous parler de ce qui se passe, de se passe dans la, la belle province. Madame Bourassa, euh, la parole est à vous. Oui, bonjour. Je vais commencer par essayer de partager mon écran. Bon, est-ce que vous voyez bien mon diaporama? Oui, oui, oui c'est parfait. Oui, bon, ben, bonjour. Comme euh, M. Paul l'a dit, je suis euh, directrice à la Direction des pratiques agro-environnementales. Mon équipe et moi sommes responsables de la coordination de l'action en agro-environnement du MAPAC. C'est donc dire que la santé des sols est au cœur de toutes nos actions. Je suis très heureuse aujourd'hui de vous pouvoir vous donner un bref aperçu de ce que nous faisons au Québec. Euh, je vais, dans cette présentation, nous allons effectuer un survol de l'agriculture au Québec et de l'état actuel des sols. Je vais ensuite poursuivre avec les principales politiques et outils gouvernementaux que, dont nous disposons et ainsi des quelques, je vais vous donner quelques exemples concrets des actions du Québec. L'agriculture au Québec, c'est 30 milliards de produits intérieurs bruts, près de 10 de l'économie du Québec. C'est aussi un demi-million d'emplois. C'est aussi 28 000 entreprises agricoles qui ont un rôle majeur dans l'occupation et la vitalité des territoires. C'est aussi des productions de plus en plus spécialisées. On a des producteurs de lait, des producteurs de foin mais de moins en moins des entreprises qui ont des productions variées et qui ont un fonctionnement systémique. L'agriculture au Québec, c'est aussi une compétence partagée entre le, le Canada et le Québec. On ne peut parler de l'agriculture sans mentionner quelques mots sur le ministère de l'Agriculture, des pêcheries et de l'alimentation du Québec. C'est 49 centres de services répartis à travers le territoire, 1600 employés au service des entreprises agricoles, dont plus de 200 sont dédiés au soutien des producteurs en agro-environnement. L'agriculture au Québec se caractérise aussi par la faible superficie qu'elle occupe. Comme on peut le constater sur la carte ici, la zone agricole identifiée en vert ne représente que 2 de la superficie du territoire du Québec. On constate aussi que ces zones sont également les plus densément peuplées. C'est donc tout un compas qu'il faut faire pour protéger cette richesse inestimable qui est le sol agricole contre l'appétit insatiable de l'urbanisation. Le Québec, c'est aussi un climat froid, une saison relativement courte si on considère qu'il arrive à l'occasion, tard au printemps, tôt à l'automne, d'avoir des températures sous les 0 degrés Celsius. De plus, comme on peut le constater en bas de la carte, les zones bénéficiant d'une saison de croissance plus longue et des températures les plus clémentes sont aussi celles qui sont les plus densément peuplées. 
comme on vient de le voir sur la diapositive précédente, au Québec, les sols à fort potentiel agricole sont une ressource limitée. Divers facteurs sont en compétition avec une partie du territoire agricole et amènent les producteurs à augmenter l'efficience de leur production pour répondre aux besoins des consommateurs. Ainsi, la modification des pratiques et des espèces cultivées amène une spécialisation des entreprises agricoles et une intensification du travail du sol. Comme illustré sur le graphique, les prairies et les pâturages sont remplacés graduellement par des cultures annuelles. Tous ces facteurs ont un effet important sur la qualité des sols et amplifient l'urgence de prendre des moyens appropriés pour le protéger. Ces tendances ne sont pas nouvelles. Les premiers constats ont été observés en 1990 dans un inventaire sur les problèmes de dégradation des sols agricoles du Québec. À cette époque, Plusieurs problématiques ont été observées en lien avec les monocultures, telles que la détérioration de la structure, de la compaction, de la diminution de la matière organique, de l'érosion, de la surfertilisation. Le Québec s'est engagé aussi dans la lutte contre les changements climatiques. Selon les derniers inventaires, les émissions de GES associées à la production agricole contribuaient à environ 10 du bilan. Québécois. Les émissions de NO2, un gaz beaucoup plus puissant que les CO2, en provenance des sols agricoles, représentent plus de 31 des émissions totales de GES par le secteur agricole. Prendre note toutefois que cette contribution ne tient pas compte des émissions énergétiques ou de la, de la dégradation du carbone dans les sols. Au Québec, Considérant les niveaux actuels de carbone des sols qui sont généralement élevés, l'importance des émissions de NO2 dans les climats froids et humides et l'aspect transitoire du carbone accumulé dans ceux-ci, il est difficile, sous nos conditions climatiques, de prévoir les gains qui peuvent être réalisés. Or, le travail du sol, les pratiques culturelles, le type de culture, et la gestion des nutriments influence le niveau de carbone du sol, mais également les émissions de GES qui découlent des activités du secteur. De plus, un sol en santé permet d'augmenter la résilience des entreprises au niveau changement face au changement climatique. C'est pourquoi la santé des sols est considérée au Québec comme un élément essentiel de la lutte contre les changements climatiques. Ainsi, nous priorisons la mise en place de pratiques et les interventions sous l'angle de l'amélioration de la santé des sols et le maintien et l'amélioration du carbone des sols en font partie intégrante. Au niveau des, des politiques, il n'existe pas de politique visant spécifiquement la santé et la conservation des sols au Québec, mais plusieurs politiques y ont, y font, y ont quand même une influence. Je vous présente ici les deux principales, soit la politique bioalimentaire 2018-2025 ainsi que le plan d'action 2013-2020 sur les changements climatiques. La politique bioalimentaire est le principal outil visant le développement du secteur bioalimentaire. Elle est le résultat d'une grande démarche de consultation avec de nombreux partenaires, ce qui a permis sa co-construction. On travaille avec nos partenaires pour faire avancer le secteur bioalimentaire. L'autre caractéristique de cette politique est de mettre le consommateur au, cent, au centre de l'action. C'est sous, sous les priorités de cette politique que le gouvernement intervient pour renforcer les initiatives en santé des sols. En effet, un secteur bioalimentaire prospère et durable passe par des sols en santé. L'importance que la santé des sols occupe dans la politique bioalimentaire est soulignée par plusieurs pistes de travail, dont les principales sont montrées sur la, la diapositive ici présente. Elles visent le développement d'une approche concertée face à la santé des sols. À travers la politique bioalimentaire et en continuité des actions entreprises depuis plus de 30 ans, 
11,5 millions a été rendu disponible pour encourager les pratiques responsables concernant la santé des sols dans le plan économique du Québec en 2018. À cela s'ajoutent des sommes déjà octroyées au MAPAC pour une agriculture durable. De plus, le ministère travaille présentement à l'élaboration d'un plan d'agriculture durable qui visera à encourager le développement durable du secteur. Ce plan mettra le producteur au centre de l'intervention. Grâce à ce plan, la santé des sols sera appelée à prendre encore plus d'importance dans nos actions. Après la politique bioalimentaire, l'autre grand outil gouvernemental est le plan d'action 2013-2020 sur les changements climatiques, dans lequel le Québec s'est engagé à réduire de 37,5 ses émissions de GES par rapport au niveau de 90. Deux actions de ce plan sont directement en lien avec le secteur agricole, soit les actions 22 et l'action 27. Elles viennent notamment soutenir les initiatives en lien avec la santé et conservation des sols. Il est à noter que ce plan d'action termine cette année. Il sera remplacé par le futur plan pour une économie verte 2020-2030, présentement en élaboration par le ministère de l'Environnement et de la lutte au changement climatique. Maintenant que nous avons survolé les différentes politiques qui nous guident, Laissez-moi vous présenter nos principaux outils qui viennent soutenir nos actions au niveau de la santé et conservation des sols. Tout d'abord, au niveau du soutien aux entreprises, nous disposons de deux principaux programmes. Le premier programme, le programme Service Conseil, finance un réseau de plus de 300 conseillers qui accompagnent les entreprises agricoles dans leur démarche en agro-environnement et plus particulièrement en offrant différents services en santé des sols. Ces conseillers viennent compléter le travail des 200 conseillers du MAPAC qui travaillent au niveau de l'agro-environnement. Notre autre programme est le programme Prix de vert. Notamment dans le volet 1, il offre des aides financières pour venir aider les entreprises dans leurs actions au niveau de la santé et conservation des sols. Par exemple, nous avons une mesure de culture de couverture qui vise à mieux protéger les sols par leur implantation. Nous avons celle sous ouvrage des, les ouvrages de conservation des sols qui nous permettent de limiter l'érosion hydrique ou encore la nouvelle mesure sur, intitulée « Équipement permettant l'épandage des lisiers à la surface du sol à l'aide d'un système d'irrigation » qui vise la réduction de la compaction des sols. Au niveau du développement des connaissances ainsi que du transfert, nous avons encore une fois le programme Pyrénées Vert qui intervient en mettant en œuvre des projets de transfert de connaissances dédiés aux entreprises agricoles. Nous avons aussi le programme Innovation qui permet la réalisation de projets de recherche, tandis que le programme de partenariat pour l'innovation en agriculture permet de soutenir les travaux de plusieurs centres de recherche dont l'Institut de recherche et de développement en agro-environnement, soit l'IRDA, le Centre de référence en agriculture et agroalimentaire du Québec, le Sérum et plusieurs autres. Tous ces programmes et politiques nous permettent de mettre en œuvre différentes actions en lien avec nos trois grands piliers en matière de santé des sols qui sont montrés ici soit nourrir et couvrir le sol, diversifier les rotations, réduire la charge à la roue afin de protéger les sols contre la compaction. À l'aide de nos programmes, de nos conseillers, à l'aide de nos centres de recherche et de nombreux acteurs du secteur agricole, plusieurs projets ont pu voir le jour, tels que le colloque santé des sols, la caravane santé des sols des une trentaine de webinaires aussi seront produits par le CRAC. On, nous allons mettre à jour l'info sol. Euh, on, nous avons aussi plusieurs initiatives régionales qui sont mentionnées ici. Avant de conclure, je dois de vous parler de l'étude de santé des sols agricoles du Québec, qui est une initiative d'importance pour, pour nous. 
Ce projet consiste à évaluer l'état des sols à partir d'un échantillonnage représentatif des principales régions pédologiques du Québec. De nombreux spécialistes et des pédologues collaborent à ces travaux. 71 séries comprenant les sols les plus communément cultivés seront étudiées six fois pour un total de 426 parcelles échantillonnées. Les propriétés pédologiques, biologiques et physico-chimiques des sols seront relevées et comparées à des sols non perturbés ou dégradés. Les sites seront, si possible, choisis en fonction de ceux de l'inventaire de 90 afin de quantifier l'évolution de la santé des sols durant cette période. Ainsi, cette étude nous permettra notamment d'évaluer l'importance et l'origine des formes de dégradation pour chaque groupe de séries de sols, d'établir des liens entre les pratiques culturales déployées, la santé des sols et leur productivité, et elle alimentera les futures interventions du Québec en, au niveau de la santé des sols québécois. En conclusion, une agriculture durable et prospère passe par la santé des sols. C'est pourquoi le Québec s'est doté de plusieurs outils et actions visant à protéger les sols et à améliorer les pratiques. Le futur plan d'agriculture durable nous permettra de, de, de poursuivre ce travail. En effet, améliorer la santé des sols ne se fera pas par magie. Le Québec doit continuer ses efforts afin de relever les nombreux défis présents. Il doit continuer le travail d'information, de sensibilisation, d'accompagnement. Il doit continuer le développement des connaissances. Il doit innover afin d'assurer le suivi de l'évolution de la santé des sols. Il doit favoriser la pratique d'une agriculture durable malgré les pressions. Effectivement, l'environnement des entreprises agricoles québécoises change et la pression des facteurs externes aux décisions des entrepreneurs agricoles est en grande augmentation. Prendre des bonnes décisions pour le bien du capital, qui est la ressource saine, n'est pas sain, mais le MAPAC continuera à soutenir les entreprises agricoles dans cette démarche. Il ne faut pas oublier qu'un sol en santé, c'est une société en santé. Je vous remercie beaucoup pour votre attention. Merci beaucoup. Madame Bourassa, pour cette présentation très complète, on a fait un tour d'horizon du, du Canada et, et du Québec. Avec, euh, moi, j'ai appris beaucoup de choses aujourd'hui, mais j'aime beaucoup l'expression « sol en santé ». On parle de santé des sols, et c'est vrai que « sol en santé », ça fait beaucoup plus dynamique que « santé des sols », qui fait un petit peu statique. Très bien, je, je rappelle à, à tous nos participants euh, de poser leurs questions euh, dans la section « questions et réponses » et de voter pour les questions qui leur paraissent les plus intéressantes, qui seront traitées en priorité lors de la session de questions et de réponses à la fin de notre session d'aujourd'hui. So now, uh, I have the pleasure to invite and give the floor to Mrs. Jenny Lester Moffitt, Under Secretary, California Department of Food and Agriculture, speak about the California uh, policy of soil health and soil carbon sequestration. So, Ginny, this, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And it's a, it is a pleasure for me to be here today with all of you guys. Um, so I will um, begin sharing my screen. And as I do so, just a brief introduction. Um, yes, again, my name is Jenny Lester Moffitt, and I am the undersecretary at the California Department of Food and Agriculture. And I come to the Department of Food and Agriculture by way of um, my family's farm and, um, and the work that we've done on our farm. And so I have some firsthand knowledge certainly of, of soil health practices, but a lot of the work that I've done at the department has really just um, been in partnership with so many of the farmers and ranchers in our state. Um, so the Healthy Soils Initiative, hopefully you guys can all see my slides. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so the Healthy Soils Initiative in California was launched in 2015. It is, um, it's, it's spearheaded by the California Department of Food and Agriculture, but, but really it's in partnership with all of our state agencies in the state. Um, and of course, the, the um, close to 70,000 farmers and ranchers that we have in California too. So just, um, again, just like Quebec, by way of, of beginning, um, it's always important for us, for me to talk about 
what we do grow in California. So in California, our agriculture is about a $50 billion a year industry. More than we're producing more than 13% of all ag production, half of our nation's fruits, nuts, and vegetables. Um, so at a time right now when we're really looking at how um, of, about healthy food and how we're producing our food and how we're getting that food to markets in a time where we've had just um, a lot of disruption in our supply chain, um, we're really proud of what we grow in California and especially, of course, our farmers and ranchers who grow it. We're producing over 400 different commodities. Um, we are the sole producer of 14 commodities from everything from almonds to raisins to, to artichokes, um, all really delicious stuff. Um, and we also export a fair amount. So 20, per, 20 billion of our exports um, or 20 billion of our ag production is exported. Um, so just a very large ag producing powerhouse. Um, and a lot of it is because of our climate, our soils and our water. Uh, so a little background on what we are doing in the state of California for our climate emissions. This, this slide is a little old at this point. Um, this is our 2017 climate strategy for the state. We are right now beginning the process of embarking on our 2022 climate strategy. We call it our scoping plan in California. Um, and so we just began some workshops this month and we'll begin over the summer really in earnest on um, developing our scoping plan which is our, again, our, our strategy for climate reduction here in the state. Um, so our 2017 strategy had reductions of 40% below 1990 levels. This is a chart here that you can see on how we plan on reducing it. Our, um, we do have a plan in place for 2022 uh, to develop that plan for carbon neutrality by 2045. So that's where we'll really begin our efforts and our focus. We know that emissions reductions are absolutely important in sequest in reducing carbon, but we, we know that we can't get through, our, through our reductions alone. That sequestration is an important part of the solution. So you'll see the tools that we have at the bottom of the screen of, of what we plan on, how we plan on doing that. We will increase the number of those tools as we look toward carbon neutrality, um, but carbon storage in the land base is a critical part of our climate strategy. Um, last year, we released a natural and working land strategy. It was really just a, um, a, a shovel in the ground, if you will, our beginning of our work on natural and working lands as a whole in the state. You can see that healthy soils is a large part of it. Of course, forest management, wetlands management, and urban greening are also key components of that as well. So our goal when we released the strategy was to increase by fivefold the number of acres in California that are in soil management practices in the state. Um, we've talked ad nauseum about the benefits, you guys know them well of healthy soils, but one thing that we have found that is very compelling in the state of California is the nexus of soil health and water supply and water quality. California is an arid state. Um, we're always discussing water when we are discussing agriculture in the state. They go hand in hand. Um, and so the, the data on, in the middle, in the blue, is a really important and powerful one. It was um, research that was just done at the end of last year that showed a 1% increase in soil organic matter in our 25 million acres of ag land that we have in the state would lead to 1.5 million acre feet of water saved per year. That's very significant and it's something that has really got the attention of our colleagues in agriculture um, because the more that water that we can save through other practices means the more that we can keep producing food to feed the nation and the world. Um, and then of course, all the people in our own backyards as well. So saving water is, is a key one. The water quality nexus is also very important as we do have many water quality challenges. And then of course, on the, in the improving public health, the cover crops data on, um, on dust management. We know no-till also has a lot of great information on dust management as well. Really just trying to get, those, get that research, disseminate the information to the public on, um, on the practices and the nexus between public health and soil health and also, of course, yield management as well um, with, our, with our growers and our communities. Um, in 2016, a year after we launched the Healthy Soils Initiative that I'll talk a little bit more about soon, 
um, we received our first tranche of money through our climate investments program. So it's funded through our cap and trade that we do in partnership with Quebec. Um, and um, we received our first tranche of money for our healthy soils program. It was um, to date, we have received 28 or we've distributed $28 million in grants. Um, that money seems like a lot for sure, but in a state like California where that money goes pretty quickly, we realized that um, it was very important not just to fund incentive projects, but also to fund demonstration projects. As, um, as it was mentioned, um, really looking at what are the barriers to adoption, we know very well um, that that familiar peer-to-peer -peer, um, extension interaction with growers, um, feeling the soil, visiting someone else's farm, learning about their practices, and then, then taking those practices back to their farm and implementing that is really important. So those demonstration projects that you see on the right, we have funded 47 of those demonstration projects throughout the state in several different crops, um, whether they range from almonds to rangeland um, to row crops and everything in between. Um, those demonstration projects are all about that. They're all about place-based practices in partnership with research institution and um, nonprofits that are helping to disseminate that information and share that information with more farmers and ranchers. We've also funded 260 direct farmer incentives. Um, and so this has been, uh, we've seen almost 40,000 tons of CO2 reduction per year as a result of this program. Our top practices in California are cover crops, compost application, and hedgerow plantings. Um, we have another, what's great is that between 2016 and 2019, we received $28 million. This year alone, we received another $28 million. So we will be distributing $25 million um, over the coming, over actually starting now and throughout the summer. Um, we have received 422 applications for incentives totaling $28 million so far. We're still, our application period is still open. And then our demonstration, we received 39 applications for $6 million. That application period is closed, so we'll be reviewing those and um, reviewing those grant applications over the coming summer. Um, so really just a, a very exciting time for the program. We know absolutely that, um, that funding is important, funding practices is important, but um, but we don't get there if we don't have technical assistance as well. So we have partnered with our UC, University of California Cooperative Extension, and we have 10 climate smart advisors throughout the state. Um, we also have funded over 40 different technical assistance providers. Hopefully some of you guys are on this call today um, and throughout the state as well, everywhere from resource conservation districts to nonprofits who are working with growers day in and day out, not just on the application of the, to apply for funding, but also on conservation planning, whole farm planning, um, carbon farm plans, all of those different things that happen um, that the growers want to have a, a full comprehensive plan of what their conservation strategies will be for the farm. Um, and how that ties with their application for the Healthy Soils Program. So technical assistance is, is very important to all of us. Um, I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about our Healthy Soils Initiative in the state. The initiative is our interagency work. And it's really, um, as you can see here, you can see the logos of all of our different, uh, different agencies that we have in the state, whether they're different water agencies. So we have, um, we have the water boards. We also have our Department of Water Resources. We also have lands commissions, whether they are Cal, our fire, um, Cal Fire, state parks, tr state transportation agency. Um, and then we of course have things like our Department of Conservation. And then of course our Air Resources Board that leads the charge on our, our scoping plan and our climate reductions. Um, so all of these different agencies touch on soil health in different ways. They all have programs. We have programs at our department. Others have programs as well that touch on things like water quality, pest management, um, biodiversity, erosion and sediment control. And so the, it, the initiative is all about being coordinated in how we approach that. Um, so we have launched the initiative in 2015. We now are um, in, in our next phase um, within our new administration. We have just relaunched it. So um, 
And just last month, we had our first meeting of our interagency team. We're pulling together what we would like to work on collectively now. The three main goals are to align our efforts to promote self soil health management practices. So really making sure that, again, we are aligned um, and that, um, that we're aligning our regulations as well. So if we have a water quality regulation, that the water quality regulation acknowledges and, and works with all of our agency teams on um, soil health components, so soil health is part of, and growers who are implementing soil health are recognized in our water quality programs, for example. Um, we want to le leverage our soil, our agency practices as well. Oops. Um, we want to leverage our agency practice funding as well. So we have funding at our department. There are other agencies that have funding for land conservation, other agencies that have funding for compost production, really making sure that we're working together and we're leveraging it so that across the, the continuum from um, waste management and um, compost production to soil health practices to land conservation to all the way down the stream that we're all coordinated in what we're doing together. Um, and then of course, the last one is really to educate constituents about the values of soil health. That's a really key important piece as well. So some of the examples of what we're working on so far um, is um, really on regulatory alignment. So we launched already a federal state on-farm compost to working group. This might seem easy to some people, but there we have, um, we have our Cal EPA, we have our federal EPA, we have our State Department of Food and Agriculture, and we have a federal Department of Agriculture, and making sure that all of us are talking as we talk about talking together and working together as we address composting. So compost practices and what are the regu regulations that are required for composting. So that means bringing materials in, what is that definition of materials and agricultural materials that come in to how much can be sold and, and shipped off site or kept on site. Um, and, and all of the things in between for time, temperature, and food safety as well. So really working so that we have, we're, um, we're working together and that we're supporting growers who want to do on-farm compost to make it as easy as possible while also being protective of the environment. I mentioned a little bit about, I have an acronym here I should um, spell out, which is the ILRP in California, that is our water quality. Um, regulations that we have. So really looking at integrating our water quality regulations across the board so that um, that soil health again is is integrated and growers that are practicing soil health um, are, are recognized for the work that they are doing on water quality. And then another acronym is SIGMA, our Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Um, this is a very important act that was just adopted back in 2014. And it's really about integrating water management with soil health management. Um, another thing we're launching in partnership with uh, the work that we're doing on our Cal State Biodiversity Initiative is a soil organic carbon map. So just last week in partnership with the department um, with the USDA and our CS, we, are, we did a couple of just preliminary workshops to start to hear from our stakeholders about as we develop a soil carbon map, what are the components that we should add? How should we be testing soil? What kind of data should we be collecting? Um, and so we're just beginning that and we'll have a planned completion of that initial map in the middle of 2021. Um, one thing I just wanna really highlight on um, is the fact that we've, we've been doing some work as a state, we've been doing a work amongst all of our agencies um, but we really scale up our practices statewide with partnerships. Um, so Paul, of course, you'll recognize this picture from a while back when we all got to gather together and, and, and congregate. Um, but this was back in 2018. This was at the global, um, uh, the, the global conference that we had in San Francisco. Um, really pulling together agriculture, having us work together because we know that at each and every one of the work that we're doing, um, we have our partnerships, we have our skill sets, and we're working with folks like consumers and buyers um, to make sure that through buying habits that we're integrating and incentivizing soil health practices, um, that our state, federal, and local laws are all aligned to really support and increase soil health practices and not disencourage or disincentivize or discourage those soil health practices 
that our research is really rallied around soil health and the integration of all of our different natural resources. Um, but again, it's all centered around farmers and ranchers because we know so well, just like um, my colleague in Canada said that, um, that looking at those barriers to adoption, identifying those barriers and overcoming those barriers all starts with the farmers and ranchers. So we need to hear from them we need to partner with them and we need to know from them what are those barriers and how can we support the scaling up. So um, scaling up is, is our theme always. Um, we know we can find so much at our department, but really the practices start on the farm, they happen on the farm. Um, and the more that we can influence rather than directly fund those practices is such an important thing of what we've been doing in California in, um, our Healthy Soils program. So I will end there. I want to thank you guys and look forward to the conversation um, that follows. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Thank you for this very clear presentation and also showing that California is quite active, uh, as we never doubt about it. And um, so I just uh, would like to recall all our participants that the question uh, and answer is still open and uh, there are some questions for each of the, the, the speaker at the moment in the list. So please speaker have a look to this also um, Q&A part in order to find some question for you and uh, we will come back to that later on. So last but not least, uh, Mr. Sylvain Maestrachi, my friend. So attaché agricole à l'ambassade de France à Washington. Euh, mon cher Sylvain, tu vas nous présenter euh, un petit résumé de la politique fédérale des États-Unis en matière de, de santé des sols. On n'a pas trouvé d'intervenant, malheureusement, qui était libre ce matin pour venir avec nous. Et donc, euh, j'ai le plaisir de te laisser, le, de laisser la parole. À toi, Bonjour Michel. tout le monde. Hello everybody. I will try to present in English so you will have to bear a very thick French accent. I'm really sorry for that, but it didn't help me to, to speak more slowly. So I will try from the outside to, to, to have a look at the federal and especially USDA's uh, role and intervention on soil health. Just to remind uh, everybody that soil health policies in the US is a very long story because it started in the 30s. After the Great Depression, farmers uh, in the Southern Plains decided to plow uh, their fields and with quite an episode of drought and winds, it led to a, a, what was called the dust bowl, so you can see on, 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 the, on the picture a lot of erosion in uh, the agricultural soil. So in part of the, of the New Deal of uh, President uh, Roosevelt, uh, there was uh, the first law that passed, what's called the National Industrial Recovery Act, that encompassed um, measures to tackle erosion. Two years later, the Soil Conservation, Conservation Act, sorry, uh, created, in fact, uh, the Soil Conservation Service that is nowadays called uh, National Resources Conservation Service, and not yet, and that's still the agency uh, dealing with uh, the fight against erosion and uh, um, more importantly on uh, the whole conservation uh, agri-environment measures. So there was the, the first technical assistance to farmers and the first conservation program that, that were uh, put into place. In the 70s, second uh, big approach, uh, the Soil and Water Resources Act uh, on 1977, created in fact a thorough strategy for uh, USDA, USDA had to, to think strategy to, to, to be sure that all the USDA programs for the conservation of soil and water were able to meet the long-term needs of the nation. So that assessment of the measures led to, in fact, through uh, assessments and through different laws 
to the actual uh, toolbox that exists at the federal level regarding uh, all the conservation uh, programs. So we shifted, in fact, from the 30s, from simply reducing erosion to building an LC agro system, and NLCS is still at the power out within the federal agencies on uh, this topic. Regarding what exists nowadays, we don't, we have very few specific soil health policy tools. I think that was shown in California, that was shown in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Canada and in Quebec. You've got a lot of tools that can be used uh, to, to promote soil health, but there is uh, a defined strategy and a defined approach. So in particular within NRCS, you've got a dedicated team and a specific strategic communication of each ecosystem. Uh, if you type uh, on, the, on, the, on the web, USDA and uh, soil health, you will have a lot, lot, lot of information. And uh, the, just to say that uh, we, we, we have a lot of discussion on the federal level about climate change with the, the new administration. But what's really interesting is that at the technical level, carbon sequestration incentives are still implemented in program program provided by USDA. So what does USDA do, uh, what does USDA uh, do on uh, knowledge building? The first is of course science, so research to 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 enhance knowledge and so else. So both through uh, the in-house uh, research service, the ARS Agricultural Research Service, and through partnership and grants with uh, a lot of universities and also with uh, local governments. Second is sharing the knowledge, the idea of USA to have a database uh, that includes the soil service that provides information uh, in almost all counties in the, in, the, in the world. So the idea of the soil survey is clarifying the different soil types and other soil properties in a given area to give everybody and inter alia farmers and ranchers information to, to help them know how they can use aquatic data mine, uh, whether a particular soil type is suited for crop or livestock and what type of management might be uh, required. You've got a lot of uh, Fact sheets on the on uh, on their website on soil quality indicators. Uh, I put there uh, the, the, the example you can you can have on the, on uh, internet. One of the idea of USDA is also to provide standard standardized uh, soil health measures to facilitate data sharing and enable nationwide comparison. So in September 2018, uh, they proposed standard methods used for soil health indicators measurement. So what was interesting is that it was something that was done as, uh, as a tool and the idea is a tool in progress. So you've got the wheels that USDH uh, used uh, itself to show that the soil health suspension strategies are good, but we are still on a path towards really modern and effective uh, policies on, the, on that material, on that material because it's difficult. USDA, so in implementation, a lot of education and outreach, so you've got communication kit for schools, you've got a lot of seminar for farmers and ranchers, and first of all, you've got training for USDA staff and technical service uh, providers that are the certified people that can help farmers and ranchers give them advice uh, in the conservation programs. Uh, second, a uh, lot of financial incentives that you've got uh, quite a lot of uh, federal conservation programs that can be used uh, for soil health. I won't 
speak of all of them, maybe just two. Uh, the environmental quality incentive program, EQUIP, that is uh, voluntary and that can help uh, take uh, something like 75% uh, of the cost of the practices used. And the second is a conservation stewardship program. The idea is for, for farmers that are already effective on environmental level to help them scale up uh, with new, new practices. Those programs can be used and are used to, 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 to implement on, on, on soil else. What was shown, I thought, was so in the uh, presentation that SORES is really something that's very local and needs a local governor. So really from the beginning, uh, coming back in the 30s in the US, uh, there was the idea of uh, local governance and local level approach on uh, the fight against erosion and, uh, and more, more, more general conservation. So you, you have the question of local soil conservation districts uh, in the spirit of the law of uh, 1935. And so they were created by state laws. It's not a federal law, it's state laws that uh, created uh, those, uh, those districts. So there are more than 3,000 now in all uh, of the 40, uh, 50 states and some uh, US uh, territories. So the assumption is planning and implementation of conservation measures. They can even buy land. So since they are, since they are created by local laws, they are quite diverse uh, within, the, within the, the US on their way of, of, of functioning. Just to, to talk, Lastly, of, uh, of the, the last news, well, the first uh, last uh, last farm bill that was uh, voted in December 18 uh, had some uh, soil health friendly components. Honestly, it was not a revolution uh, on the soil health, but there are some uh, stones that are there that are really interesting. Just uh, maybe uh, tell about two of them. Uh, the first is that the law required on the conservation uh, stewardship program uh, to enhance alerts. That's one of the objectives that put for the program in the law. Uh, so the, 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 it mandated the government to manage CSP to enhance alerts to the greatest extent possible. So that shows the emphasis that, that put on that, that to on else. The other is within the agriculture and food in research initiatives, so more on the research side, that added uh, solar else as an environmental research. So there is uh, also an emphasis on solar else. And uh, the third is, uh, I really quite like it, on the biomass research development. Carbon dioxide intended for permanent sequestration uh, uh, or utilization is deemed by the law as a high value bio based product eligible for research and development promotion. So, the idea is also to have on both sides incentive and research a lot of emphasis on solar. The, the map that's shown on the, on the, on the presentation showed a uh, photography of what's going on within uh, the states. So just to say that uh, you've got, so the green states have one where you've got an LCSOL legislation that has passed, so that's uh, in force. In uh, dark, darker blue, you've got the one that has a project pending. And last but not least, because if you see that I've still not spoken about California, you've got the one with turquoise. So the, the, those are the ones that not only have uh, legislation in force, but are scaling up uh, with another one. 
with that, I think I've been very, very short, but Paul, I will give back the floor to you. Thank you. Oui. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sylvain, for this presentation and this effort to try to synthesize the, the US uh, policy on soil health. Uh, even though from, from Europe, you can see that uh, there are still something that are uh, being uh, managed by the federal government, even though it's not completely uh, absent. So it, it's interesting to sometime to have a, a quick look at what's going on really. So thank you very much to all our speaker. So it brings us to the, the end of this presentation part. And um, we have now roughly 20, 25 minutes to, to devote it to question and answer. And uh, so I will, uh, I will try to start with some, uh, so all the speaker can see the question uh, and uh, see that some are more popular than the other. I will start in the order of uh, appearance, I would say, and I will ask um, Mrs. Clearwater first. Um, there is a question that for all the speakers, but uh, we'll start with you, Mrs. Uh, Lucy Clearwater. Um, one people ask if uh, there is any consideration in, in Canada and then in Quebec and in the US and in California uh, about uh, the use of uh, biochar. Uh, so that would be the, the first question. How is biochar is involved in the policy of, uh, of the Canada, then Quebec, USA, and, and California, if any? And um, for Mrs. Clearwater also, there is another question. Is there a distinction to establish between uh, areas planted with tree almost in monoculture? and area that are started with regenerative diversified forest, especially in the south of Canada. So uh, Mrs. Clearwater, do you, you want to take a minute to answer this question? Yeah, certainly, yeah. Uh, so for the first question on biochar, um, it's, it's not something that's really uh, part of formal agricultural policy yet in the federal government, but we are as a department funding several research projects on um, the benefits of biochar. Um, so I think once we have some more conclusive findings, particularly as it pertains to how it performs throughout the country, because we are such a large country, uh, it may at some point make its way into federal policy. Um, but again, I think a lot of on-farm action is, is generally the jurisdiction of the provinces and territories. They're the ones that design the programs and determine what practices they would like to see on their provincial lists. So uh, I, I suppose that would probably be a better question for Ellen. Um, uh, and for the second question, I can certainly look at that. Regarding... Uh, I'm just trying to see it. Uh, areas planted with trees uh, versus areas uh, stewarded as regenerative forests. I actually, I don't work for Natural Resources Canada, Canadian Forestry Service, but I do believe on their website, they do have some distribution maps for managed and unmanaged forests. I don't know to what extent they would get into the type of management practices, but that would be a question for my colleagues at Natural Resources Canada. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, um, Lucy. Uh, so, moving to, to Hélène, uh, Madame Bourassa. Uh, même question concernant l'utilisation des, des biochars uh, au, au Québec et, et éventuellement la façon dont les biochars sont pris en compte dans la politique uh, provinciale. Et puis, il uh, y a une deuxième question qui a été posée. Est-ce que uh, au niveau du Québec, il y a un projet pour uh, reconnaître en quelque sorte l'agroforesterie dans la politique agricole du Québec, sachant qu'on est effectivement à cheval entre l'agriculture et la foresterie. Mais vous l'avez, je crois que vous l'avez mis dans votre, dans votre présentation. Et, et donc, quel est le statut de l'agroforesterie vis-à-vis du, du Québec et du gouvernement, du gouvernement de la province Votre micro est coupé. Oh, Est-ce est que vous m'entendez maintenant <rire> 
Parfait. Euh, concernant le biocar, euh, plusieurs études ont été réalisées sur euh, les potentiels de l'utilisation sur, sur les sols. Euh, on a eu quelques projets pour la production de biocar au Québec, mais cependant, actuellement, les, les coûts de la matière demeurent euh, quand même assez préoccupants prohibitif là, pour une utilisation à grande échelle. Le marché qui est utilisé actuellement est plus destiné à l'horticulture. Donc, nous n'avons pas de, de programme actuellement là, qui vont encourager l'utilisation de, des biocars. Pour ce qui est de l'autre question concernant l'agroforesterie, euh, ben, c'est sûr que qu'on s'en vient bientôt dans un nouveau plan d'agriculture durable où l'agroforesterie va avoir sa place, mais ce plan-là est encore en train de, de se construire. Donc, euh, je, je n'ai pas les, les détails en, euh, présentement. Mais l'agroforesterie, la biodiversité sont tous des éléments qui sont importants et je crois qu'ils font partie d'une agriculture durable. Donc oui, jusqu'à un certain point, l'agroforesterie va être considérée dans, dans les prochaines politiques en environnement du MAPAC. Très bien. Merci beaucoup pour, pour ces réponses. Euh... Concernant les, les, ce qui a été posé comme question à propos des, des zones en sylviculture par rapport aux, aux zones en, en, en foresterie régénérative, euh, à laquelle Mme Clearwater a, a indiqué que vous pourriez peut-être apporter des éléments de réponse, vous, a, vous avez quelques éléments à apporter sur cette question euh, Pouvez-vous me poser plus clairement la question là, je, je pense qu Il faut que j'aille voir la, la question exactement. Oui, c'est la première question qui a été posée par Jeanne Bergeron. Euh, c'est en anglais. Is there a distinction of establish between, to establish between area planted with trees, almost monocultures, with uh, area uh, planted uh, and started as regenerative diversified forest, especially in the southern Canada hardwood and mixed testicity uh, zones? That's a question number two in, in the list at the moment. Ben, écoutez, moi, je ne vous répondrai probablement pas directement à, à cette euh, question parce que ça concerne plus le, le secteur d'activité du, du MFFP, qui est un autre ministère, le ministère de la Forêt, des Faunes et des Parcs. Euh, il faudrait que ce soit mes, mes collègues là, qui pourraient mieux vous donner les réponses que moi, parce que moi, chez nous, on, se, on spécialise plus au niveau de l'agriculture, plus que de, de l'entretien et de la forêt. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Vous avez, sur la, les questions à réponse, aussi bien Lucie, Clearwater que, que vous-même, vous avez deux petites questions un peu plus personnelles où on vous demande des contacts éventuellement pour poursuivre le dialogue. Je, je vous demanderai d'y répondre directement. On n'a pas forcément besoin de, de venir sur ces réponses-là dans la partie publique. Um, so, Jenny, if you are still around, <laughs> yes, I can see you. Um, There is a question about um, what, is, what is the estimated market value of one ton of carbon credit that would make the difference uh, to widening significantly Californian farmers' adoption of soil and water conservation uh, and restoration practices. And there is another one less, a little bit more technical, I would say, Um, is there any technique available for home growers to measure the carbon content of our soils? Well, I'm not sure you are a gardener and you can answer this question, but it was dedicated to you. <laughs> so please, uh, if you can answer the first question about the, the price of the estimated market value of one ton of carbon credit. Yeah, and that's a, um, that's a great question and something that I, I did not mention and I should have mentioned in my presentation Um, our Healthy Soils program is, is very much modeled after and partnered with the United States Department of Agriculture and Natural Resource Conservation Services um, EQIP program. So we look at that, we take the practices that they have in their program. Um, we have partnered with Colorado State University and um, 
and Keith Postian's team and Amy Swan's team on the Comet model. So the Comet Farm and the Comet Planner model. And that model takes this NRCS conservation practices, does an evaluation of what the greenhouse gas reduction is for those practices. And then we, um, we base our payment rate off of NRCS, the NRCS payment rate. Um, that said, we do have some of our own practices. So we fund because, because of circular economies, because we have a very big um, effort like so many do on, um, on composting in California, uh, making sure that we're diverting organic materials from our landfill. So we do have um, compost practices that are not part of NRCS conservation practices um, that we've worked with the Colorado State team, University team to develop those um, sequestration models for, for the greenhouse gas reduction. Um, but I wanna be clear that our program is, is a grant program. It's not a carbon credit program. Um, and, um, and so I just wanted to make sure that that was, that was very clear that we're not doing any carbon credit trading that the funding is coming from our cap and trade program that is a trading program, but it's grant dollars that we are distributing to growers. Um, so I don't have direct, going back to the first that question, I don't have the estimated market value of what that might be. Um, but I do, we can say that, you know, based on the payment rates that we've had, we've had, um, especially this year, substantial in interest from farmers. We have an over application right now of farmers who are interested. So it seems like the payment rates that we've got lined up um, are enough to incentivize growers. Um, but I don't have an answer to what the, the carbon credit program might be as far as um, one ton um, and, and that price. Um, and, I, and, and yes, I don't know what tools there are available for, um, for home gardeners. I know that we do a lot of partnership, as I mentioned before, with our UC Cooperative Extension and they have a Master Gardener program. Um, I think I, I'd be curious to see if that's something that they've looked at and explored so I can check with them and see. Okay, thank you, Jenny. I think we, we will have the pleasure to, to have uh, Keith Postian um, in, in our session with the scientist. So I think Keith will, will explain a little bit more about that. And uh, we also have, uh, in the last session on Friday, uh, somebody, uh, Dan Hamburg from uh, Indigo Ag, and I think he will explain also what uh, the, the process for the, the carbon credit and all, all what they are launching in the state at the moment. So th thank you very much, Jenny. J just um, to, to give you the floor also about the, the biochar, how, how is, uh, uh, what is the, um, the consideration about in California about biochar? Yeah, actually, um, so again, California is a very arid state. We have, as you've seen in the news a lot lately, um, we have forest fires. And so biochar actually is a big conversation with us in California as a way to, um, to look at forestry management. Um, we recognize that in some areas of our forest, we need to thin um, to, for, to maintain for, um, for both biodiversity and plant health and forest health, but also for, for forest fires as well. So we've been looking at biochar as, as um, one of the tools that for forest management that they can use um, to, to thin the forest, turn, turn that woody material into biochar and then have that be available. So um, perhaps when we think about it and pencil that through on a cost benefit, um, uh, there might be some benefits there just because, because it's also part of just our, our vegetation management as a whole. Um, we also have, of course, about 1.2 million acres of almonds, all of which generate shells every year that are a source of biochar. So we have a lot of sources of biochar. So there's a lot of interest in biochar development. And then of course the markets for biochar. As far as research, um, we have some climate change research dollars that we have allocated to looking at um, and analyzing biochar and soil health and soil carbon sequestration. That research was just funded a year ago, so we don't have results yet, um, but that is one that we have been actively researching for some time. Um, at our department, we also have a fertilizer research and education program um, where um, biochar is now considered part of that program. So we've been funding some biochar research through that as well, more on, less on the carbon sequestration, but more on other aspects as far as water quality um, and, and, and soil water holding retention as well. So. We're in the very early stages of some of that research, but we're very interested in, in exploring the opportunities with biochar. 
Thank you very much, Jenny. There is a, there is a technical question on the Q&A also concerning the the different kind of composting that you are promoting in the in the California. So if you want to answer directly to that uh, that person, that <laughs> that will be great. Um, and also, I've noticed that there are some some dialogue existing at California between California and Quebec uh, on some aspects. That that's very interesting and. Um, uh, is uh, Hélène or, or Jenny, could you give us some information a little bit more about what kind of dialogue there is between the, the province and the state? Our dialogue is, is very much on the on climate and our, um, so we share an auction for, for our climate program. Um, that said, I think, um, you know, I think we would love to have more of a dialogue on soil health as well. And so, um, but the dialogue that California and Quebec and the partnership that we have is, is at this point very focused and, and for um, for quite some time now on, on the, our auction and our joint auction that we do for cap and trade. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Silva, there is a question for you uh, before I think you will be the last one. Uh, I don't know if you will be able to, to answer the question. This is a very sensitive one because it's a little more internal to you, to the US. So I let you the, the feeling as a diplomat to just answer the question. <laughs> so, uh, Sylvain, it's in French. Comment expliquez-vous ce qui paraît comme une totale dichotomie entre la politique de l'USDA et ce que le NRSS propose depuis quelques années maintenant, à partir de quelques vidéos, paraît-il, qui circulent sous la manche Je ne sais pas ce que ça sous-entend. Je pense que c'est un petit peu ce que nous avons constaté lorsque je me suis rendu à, à Washington euh, il y a deux ans, où effectivement euh, on parlait de, ouvertement au niveau de, de NRCS de, des pratiques, de tout ce qui pouvait être indiqué aux agriculteurs pour maintenir la, la quantité de carbone organique dans leur sol, leur montrer l'importance de la chose en termes de résistance à l'érosion et, et à l'eau notamment. Je pense que c'est à ça qu'il est fait référence. Mais, mais on n'avait pas trouvé non plus spécifiquement d'antinomie avec la politique de l'USD au sens large. Donc, je, je te laisse répondre si tu veux répondre. Bien, je ne je sais pas si je serai diplomatique. Euh, je vais répondre en français, hein, ce sera plus simple. Je ne sais pas si je serai diplomatique, mais ce que je pense, c'est que le, le NRCS représente une composante de la politique américaine qui est effectivement le lien entre l'agriculture et l'environnement. Et qu'il euh, y a aussi, euh, y compris euh, au NRCS, euh, l'objectif d'une agriculture américaine qui soit compétitive, qui soit en capacité de nourrir sa propre population et de nourrir aussi euh, d'exporter des nouveaux aliments. Donc je pense que ce n'est pas une dichotomie, je pense qu'on a un focus euh, plus important du NRCS euh, sur l'environnement que ce qu'on voit dans d'autres administrations. Pour être honnête, hein, pour prendre le cas de la France, euh, l'intégration entre les politiques économiques et les politiques environnementales. Maintenant, c'est dans la même direction, mais ça a 10 ans. Hein. Et pendant, pendant très longtemps, il y a eu beaucoup de discussions en interne. Donc, je ne crois pas qu'il y ait vraiment une dichotomie. Je pense que c'est plutôt une logique, effectivement, d'orienter un petit peu, de réorienter une agriculture pour faire un peu plus d'environnement, tout en ayant tout, en, en, un ensemble de, de, de politiques qui promeuvent le, le, la, la, la compétitivité. J'ai vu passer une question sur... Euh, 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 santé des sols et, euh, et usage des, des pesticides, je pense que ça fait partie des points. C'est-à-dire que la santé des sols traite de l'accroissement du carbone et de l'accroissement de, la, de la matière organique, donc du sol vivant. Il euh, n'y a pas d'objectif dans cette politique-là de la part du BFG d'une réduction euh, de l'usage des, des pesticides. Il y a effectivement les pesticides comme un des outils dans la grande boîte à outils pour permettre d'améliorer la, la santé des sols. Merci, Sylvain. So, I think it's uh, come to an end for our session. It's uh, almost two hours that we spent together. Um, it, it's quite long. And I would like to thank warmly all our speakers for their availability, their time, the explanation, the presentation, and the effort to, to work under such a circumstance. It's not so easy. It would have been a lot better to be in presence and having time now to share a beer with you and asking directly some question. But well, that will be for next time when the, the COVID will be totally behind us. Hope so that there will not be another one coming <laughs> next year. 
So thank you very much again. Um, before telling you bye bye for the for today and uh, give you uh, rendezvous for tomorrow, Antonius, I would like to give the floor to Antonius for some uh, recommendation and some information for tomorrow. So Antonius, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Jenny, Hélène, Lucie, and Sylvain. It was really, très, très interesting. It was really rich. Um, I enjoyed it so much. So a couple of reminders for tomorrow. Um, so tomorrow, rendezvous at 10.30 Eastern time for the first round table, farmers experience and the proposal from the ground. We'll be waiting for you all. Today, we had more than 90 people uh, listening to us. That was, that was great. So, this afternoon, we, you will receive an email from Regeneration Canada with one, the link for tomorrow, two, the PDF of today's um, presentation, which our, our panelists agreed to share with, uh, with us all, as well as a, uh, a couple of questions to reflect upon until tomorrow. So tomorrow, during the Q&A period, we're going to launch a couple of polls um, uh, with maybe five, six questions, and you will have time uh, to respond uh, during the Q&A period, but we thought that we will send it to you prior to this so you can actually think about, about your answers. Um, all the sessions are recorded. Uh, we're going to work on editing a little bit, and then we'll share it with you as soon as we can. Um, and with this, I hope you a wonderful, uh, I wish you a wonderful day for those of you from our side of the Atlantic and a wonderful evening for you, Paul, all the team and everybody watching from the other side of the, of the ocean. Um, I don't know if you have anything to end, Paul. Well, just, just to, to say the same news uh, that uh, we will find, uh, we'll see you tomorrow at the same time for our second session with farmers and ranchers. So um, as you already mentioned, but I insist because it's important, uh, be aware that the, this meeting of tomorrow will be accessible very, via a specific Zoom link, which is different from the one we used today. And uh, you will find this link on the agenda and we'll re you will receive also a mail as uh, Antonius just said before. And uh, so have a good day to all of you and uh, see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.